Living Water Church family, how are you? I have a few announcements for you. Uh, first of all, we have Zoom prayer. Just a reminder on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, uh, Zoom online at noon and at church here on Thursday. So Thursday here at church. Uh, also, men's breakfast will be moved to uh, July 11th instead of July 4th for obvious reasons. Uh, so enjoy your July 4th weekend. Um, if you would like to sign up for uh, Bacon Take, please email Lisa. We'll have the email her email on the screen. We only have one volunteer for the month of July, so we're seeking other volunteers. So please consider signing up. Uh, also, as many of you know, Pastor Amy had her surgery this week, and it went well. And she's at home resting now and recovering. Uh, Pastor Ken said that they have seen the hand of the Lord working. Uh, but please pray for the pain and management and just for her to recover quickly. Also, uh, memory verse, June's memory verse. Would you say it with me? It's Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is for me says the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. Let's worship the Lord together.
Father God, we thank you that everything in our life that we've needed, you supplied. Every chain in our life that we've needed broken, Lord, you've broken that chain. Thank you, Father God. We give you praise now, Lord Jesus. Just worship you.
the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus
call me out there. Father, give us the courage and the confidence in you that we can do what you've called us to do. Not what we've called us to do, what you've called us to do. And Lord, give us that confidence. Father, God, as we go through our life, just help us to call on you. Call on Jesus' name. Just keep amazing us day after day and Lord, help us to look for it. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Would you join us as we uh, pray for for the nations? We want to pray for Mexico. They had an earthquake. I believe it was several, but they had one that was 7.4 magnitude. Uh, we want to pray for Chicago. Last weekend there was shootings. Over 100 people were shot. So we just want to pray for them. And also we want to pray for a quick recovery for our own Pastor Amy, for Akia, and for those in our church that um, need healing. And recovery. So would you join us in prayer? So Lord, we just come together, Lord, as one, and we cry out for the nations, Lord. We cry out, Lord, for all the persecuted nations. We cry out, Lord, for those nations that have been affected, Lord. We cry out for uh, Mexico, Lord, as this earthquake has hit and it's destroyed things and it's killed people, Lord. We just ask, Holy Spirit, would you come in, Lord? Would you come in, Holy Spirit, and bring peace to those families, Lord? And we ask for help, Lord, from other nations. We ask for nations to come together in this time, Lord to be there for one another. We lift up our brethren, Lord, all around the world, Jesus, and we ask for your healing. Holy Spirit, would you pour out upon your church? Let this opportunity, let this be an opportunity for the church to rise up and be the light of Christ. We ask for provision, Lord Jesus, like never before, for provision from places where people have never seen it, and they will say, truly, this was the hand of the Lord that has provided for us. We ask for all those countries who are in need, Jesus, those countries countries that need uh, food, that need just help, Lord, would you send the help through your church, Jesus. Lord, we ask for our very own nation through this difficult time, Lord, with all these shooting and all these riots and all these things going on. We ask that you pour out your spirit, Lord. This is a perfect time and an opportunity for your presence to touch people, for your presence to change lives. And we ask, Holy Spirit, would you convict people of sin? Would you bring people back to Jesus? Holy Spirit, would you bring back those, those ones that have fell away? Would you bring them back, those prodigals and the families, Lord? Let them see that they need you, that you're the only hope, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, we cry out for all those who are sick. We cry out for our own Pastor Amy, for Akia, for Stan. We just cry out for members of our church, Lord, that are in pain, that need healing. We just release it right now in the name of Jesus, and we bind sickness. We bind infirmity in Jesus' name. And we ask Lord, for quick recovery, Lord. We command the pain to go in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you that you're the with us, God. We thank you that we could trust you, that you're with us even in surgery. You're with us in supernatural healing. You're with us, Lord. So we just love you and we glorify you, Lord. We thank you that we're never alone. We love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, Living Water Church. This is Melanie. I'm here with you from my home. I'm so excited to bring you this word today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to share some testimonies with you. I know that many of you know that the church has been giving out groceries each Monday in June, and it has just been an open door 
Um, people are in just hard times and their hearts are open. Um, so one testimony I have, this gentleman's come three weeks in a row and he's been getting his groceries. I would describe, uh, describe him as kind of a gruff, big, burly guy. Um, he's accepted prayer the last couple weeks, um, but somewhat closed off or resistant. And then this week, um, my friend Clover and I, we, we ran some groceries out to him and I just said, can we pray with you? And he said, sure. So we put the groceries in the car and as we began to pray, the Holy Spirit just, just downloaded, um, some information about his life. And I began to just pray into broken relationships and redemption over those relationships. And I had my eyes closed the whole time. And when I opened my eyes, this big rough, tough man was just weeping and he didn't have words. He, he was just overwhelmed by the spirit. And I said, God is speaking to you. And he just couldn't even talk. Just so received what, what God was saying. And I said, God loves you. He cares about you. And he said, I got to go. I mean, he just couldn't even just handle how God had spoken to him. Um, Oh, just ministered to to Clover and I. The next um, testimony I have is a young gentleman. Um, he pulled in. I hadn't seen him before, so this last week was his first week picking up groceries. And I I asked him where he worked. It looked like he just got off work. He said he worked in senior living. And I said, "Well, can I pray with you?" He said, "Sure." I said, "What's your name?" He said, "Jeremiah." I said, "Oh, like the prophet." And he said, "Sure." And so I began to pray. And as I was praying for him, man, there was just such a calling on this young man's life. And I was just praying. And as I opened my eyes, I told him, I said, there is a mark on your life. God has called you for a purpose. And he has a plan with your life to serve him, to glorify him. And he just wants to remind you that he's not disappointed in the decisions you've made. He's calling you back. And you could just tell his heart was wide open and he was just deep in thought and teary eyed. And he reached out to shake my hand. And as I shook his hand, I said, Jeremiah, your, your name, your name means a lot. And God's calling you back. Come back next week. And he just said, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, God was just moving. He was just speaking. Um, the last one that I have was really good. We've had this gentleman over the last four weeks we've been doing this, the very first week he drove by the church and he saw our signs for free groceries and he pulled up and instead of waiting for his groceries, he got out of his car with groceries. And so he starts walking up to the church. I said, Hey, how can I help you? He said, Oh, I saw your sign and I wanted to run up to King Supers and get you guys groceries. And so he's been bringing us groceries every week. Um, he lives in California, but he's been here for uh, just a little bit to get his kids settled here in Colorado. And I mean, it's just such a blessing. He he just went out of his way to sow into this ministry. So he comes in, and the last week, we hadn't heard from him. He didn't, he didn't come. And then right as we gave away all 55 bags of groceries, he pulls up. And he said, I'm so sorry. I'm kind of late today, but I have tons of groceries. So he comes with these groceries, and Clover and I, we were just praying. It's like, God, do you want us to save these for next week? Or do you want us to give out more? And we felt like the Lord said, pack up two more bags. So we packed up two more bags. And sure enough, one car comes pulling in. And I just thought, God really wants to talk to this person. And so uh, Ricky and I, we ran out there to give them their groceries. And as I began to speak to them, we just discovered that they would prefer Spanish. And so Ricky ran in and grabbed George, my husband. And he came out to translate for me. And I said, tell him that, that God set it up where... They got the last bag of groceries. We were going to have to turn them away, but God provided so that we could have this conversation that God is not a God of coincidences, but that he wants to get your attention. And they, their attention was gotten at that point. They, it was a woman in the driver's seat and a woman in the passenger seat. And I, I just knew right away, God, it, God just spoke this word over this woman. Um, he said, you're going through the dif most difficult time. And so George translated that for me. And right away, she just began to weep. And we could just see her broken heart. He said, her heart is breaking, but cares. And um, George prayed over her. And 
they just kept saying, how could you know that? How could you know what we were going through? And we said, God, he cares about you. He's, he's a father to you and, and he wants you to live for him. And oh, it was just so powerful. Um, so we have one last week of this ministry. One thing we discovered was over the course of these last several weeks that I'd say 90% of these people are in desperate need. Um, we've seen several people living in cars. We've seen people battling addiction. Um, I talked to a woman this week. Her spouse was in prison. Um, a lady that I've really gotten to know over the last four weeks is raising her granddaughter twin, grandson twins um, because their parents are in prison. Just hard situations and just so thankful for the groceries and the prayer. And honestly, for me, this ministry has been just a way to just revamp how I look at people and remember to love well. I think it's so easy in our day-to-day -day life to look down on people and assume that, you know, they just made bad choices. And that's why they're in the circumstance of homelessness or addiction. But doing this outreach has just revealed to me that judgment in my heart and that all of these people's destinies matter to God. And their circumstances can't define them. And, and their destiny should matter to us. Uh, it's just been really, really great. You know, God's love doesn't have favorites. And that's just been something he's been speaking to me as, as we prayed for these people. So let's pray together now. God, we just thank you for what you've done. All the seeds that have been sown into these people's lives that I was testifying about. And God, we just ask for your your truth and your grace to reign in their lives, that they would truly surrender to you and you would bring them hope, true hope that can only come from you. And Lord, we just surrender this word to you that I'm about to give. I just ask that you would use it for your glory. I just surrender my mouth to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start in Psalms. You know, we're studying the book of Psalms. So chapter 40, and I'm going to read out of the NLT. In verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Amen. So in this first verse, it says, I waited patiently. Waited patiently. Who does that? Waits patiently. It's almost like an oxymoron in our culture. You know, waiting goes a little more often. We see it going with frustration. Waiting can be associated with anxiousness. Waiting goes better with worrying, right? These are the feelings that we see in our world associated with waiting. Yet David says here, he says that he waited patiently and God heard his cries. God, in the Bible, it's clear that he instructs us to wait patiently to wait on him, to wait on him quietly. In Psalm 62, verse 1, it says, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. And if you skip down to 62, verse 5, it says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock. In my salvation, my fortress, where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Isn't that good? God instructs us to wait on him. And then in Isaiah chapter 30, just to kind of reiterate that the word is clear about waiting. Isaiah 30 verse 15 says, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and in confidence is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, I will get help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle. 
but the only swiftness you are going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. Yikes. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever worried and called it prayer? Ow. We can be worried and pray, but worry, worrying itself can't be mistaken for prayer. See, because we know that God knows our hearts and he knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. But in my own life, at times I've convinced myself that my concerns are my prayer. See, prayer is this intentional expression of our hearts. It's an intentional expression to God. Worry is more often a harboring, a concerning that we keep and harbor in containing the concerns and not expressing. See, in my own life, I've even seen worry be a contempt for God. It's almost like this dialogue of, well, God knows my circumstance, but he hasn't changed it yet. Yeah, he knows everything I'm going through, but I don't see him coming around fixing anything yet. Let me just tell you this, talking about God is far different than talking with God. Talking about God is far different than talking with Him. You know, I'll never forget this conversation I had with a woman. She'd been battling with addiction most of her life, and as I began to share Jesus with her, she said, Oh, I've always known about God. Oh, it struck me. It'll stick with me forever. That statement, Oh, I've always known about God. And now I remember that statement she made, and I use it in my own life. And, and I ask myself, how much of my life is lived out of knowing God versus knowing about God? See, my words and my choices and my worship, how much of it comes from knowing him? How much of it comes from knowing about him? Do you catch the difference there? It's a huge difference. I start a lot of stories with this con disclaimer, if you will. I tell people, um, this was BC, which means before Christ in my life, right? So I, I oftentimes start a story and, and make sure they know this was BC. This was BC. In Psalms 106, the story of the Israelites are being retold and they're being freed from Egypt, free from slavery, excuse me, God had swallowed their enemies in the Red Sea. And they sang praises to him. They just sang a new song of praise to him. But it says right after they were singing praises, right after that, in verse 13, 106, 13, it says, Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done. They wouldn't wait for his counsel. In the wilderness, their desires ran wild, testing God's patience in the dry wasteland. Let's not forget what we've been freed from. Let's not quickly forget what he's done. Oh, if you are in a dry season, if you are in wilderness, if you're going through the motions, if you're in this season where I know about God, but I don't know if I know him, take a look, take a moment, look back in your life and find that moment, find those moments where he saved you, he cleansed you, he turned your life around. Set my feet up on the solid ground. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Where's that born-again moment? That moment when his holiness was so bright and your sin was so apparent. That beautiful exchange of his forgiveness for sins. He pulled you out of the pit. He pulled you out of the mud. He pulled you out of the mire and he steadied your feet. Look back and remember. Don't be quick to forget. So as I was saying, before Christ, 
I start a lot of stories that way. Before Christ, I was working at a bank. I was a service manager, which just meant that I managed the tellers. I kind of oversaw the quality of our service. And this bank, they lived and died by customer surveys, almost to a fault. I mean, people were getting promoted over customer surveys. People were being demoted over customer surveys, even living in fear of losing their job over customer surveys. This was just the culture of the bank at the time. And over the years, this category in the customer surveys that was really challenging to do well in was called wait time. So really what it was is however long a customer had to wait and whether they were pleased with that amount of wait. Uh, it was a challenging thing to get right. You know, we had learned as a team, the team I managed, um, a couple teams I managed, we had learned how to be efficient. We knew what our busiest times were. We were ready and staffed well. Um, we cared about our job. We, we decided that what we needed to do was start influencing people's perception of the amount of time they wait. So what we did is, as a bank, we started hanging TVs in the lobby. And we gave out suckers and greeted everyone as they stood in line and talked about the weather with them. We would even speed walk or jog in high heels across the lobby and just make sure that they knew that we were hustling. But as I look back, if a customer comes in frustrated, five minutes is going to feel like a long time. And if you come in content, five minutes is a breeze. So someone comes in to last, cash their last check because they were just fired. Or they come in nervous because of all the fees on their account from overdrafting. The TV on the wall is a joke. Talk about the weather is just not interesting. See, the key to excellent service, as I found over the years, was that customers perceived that you care about them. You care about getting their transaction right. You care about how much time they spend with you. you. Care that they just lost their job. So let me ask you this. What is your perception of God as you wait on him? How do you perceive our heavenly father? As you wait for victory in your marriage? As you wait for salvation for your brother, your sister, or your son, or your daughter? Or you're waiting on test results from the doctors? Or you're just waiting for your teen not to be a teen anymore? What is your perception? Is it that he's reluctant? Unreliable? That he has favorites? Maybe that he's punishing you. See, the reality is, as you wait, God cares about you. He cares about your pain, and he cares about your struggle, and he cares about your worries and your fears. He cares about your destiny. So what is influencing your perception of God? Pastor Amy shared a quote last week from Kristen, Christine Kane. Um, and the quote was this, sometimes we can be so blinded by our experience and reality that we invalidate someone else's. I'm going to change it up just a little bit for the context. This is the new one that I have for you. Sometimes we can be so blinded by our experience and reality that we invalidate the truth. So what do I mean by that? You know, the harsh or even traumatic experiences that we go through can influence our perception of God. Why did he let this happen? Why doesn't he intervene? But the truth about God is that he is loving and he is kind and he cares for you. And trusting in God requires us to know the truth about his character. Knowing about him won't lead us to trust him. We must know him. You know, I want to be cautious in how I share this story, but um, I've prayed about it, and I feel like I should share it. Uh, many of you know that 
our oldest son, Abel, is not George's biological father. Um, not by bi <laughs> biological son, excuse me. And we, George and I met when Abel was nine months old. And we weren't following the Lord. Um, then when Abel was about three, we radically came to Jesus. When Abel's, Abel was three years old. And about nine months after that, Abel's biological father came back into the picture. And I say that because he had been absent, and so he just wasn't in our lives, and um, there hadn't been much contact. And so we ended up in this situation where we had to go to court custody. And his, his birth father wanted 50% custody. And I think it's important to express to you that I, it wasn't just that we hadn't seen him in a long time. It, I was concerned about the safety of Abel. Um, as a mother, I was just genuinely concerned about him spending time with his father. And it became this, this season in my life that really, really shaped me. And I was, I was really afraid. Uh, we went through this grueling trial experience, and there was one moment where I was just like, God, Abel, it's yours. No, I just trust you with his life. He's yours. And then the very next moment, I was ready to pack my bags and move to Mexico. <laughs> and then the next moment, I would repent and say, God, I want to put you in control. And it was just one of those things, you know, in the next moment I'm having nightmares about Abel dying. And I, it was horrible. I was just overcome with, with fear. And I remember George, he was just so gracious to me during this. Um, he had concerns too, of course. Abel is his child, his son, and he really was concerned. But I remember him just telling me, we need to wait on the Lord. And honestly, I got to the point where I said, well, what does that look like? What does that look like? Because I need to make decisions and I have to fix this. I've got to, I've got to protect my son. And I just wanted to take charge. I wanted to take control. I wanted to protect people. And I, I would go in my room and I would pace in my room and literally just scream at God. Say, God, you have to intervene. God, you have to. Look at what's going on. You know what's going on. You have to save him. You have to prevent this. Please, Father. And just telling him what to do. All that being said, looking back at that, it, I didn't wait patiently. I didn't wait quietly. And God had mercy for me throughout the whole thing. I went and hired the most expensive attorney we could find and honestly I think I did it rash rashly without God's opinion and yet he sent checks in the mail people were giving us money and we didn't even tell them what was going on so he had mercy throughout but through that I, I learned what it really means to wait on God and it, it means and it looks like that deep within my gut, within my spirit, I know that I know that no judge is going to determine Abel's future. And no man is going to determine Abel's future. And when I am in agreement with God and truly surrender to God, Abel's future is his hands. And he's a good father. I can't tell you that I am waiting patiently regarding every situation in my life now, but it's absolutely a process and something that I want to do well. I want to have a deep knowing, a deep understanding, a deep trust that God is good and he's faithful and he's got me and he's got my family all through it all. You know, the outcome that we got might not have been the perfect outcome in the court situation, but it was because God is in control and he knows and he knows what is good for Abel and he knows what Abel's future holds. I don't. You know, 
I've just been pondering God's holiness. What does holy really mean? I, I think of set apart, set apart to be holy or sacred. His holiness, I, I think as I've thought about it, his holiness is a recognition of his perfection. It's like recognizing that he's flawless. Isaiah got to see the Lord, and the word describes that as he saw the Lord, he had six, the Lord had six seraphim accompanying him. And each of the seraphim, they had six wings. So there was two wings to cover the eyes, two wings to cover the feet, and then two wings to fly to keep near him. And as they flew and as they covered their eyes and their feet, they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple and the temple filled with smoke. They couldn't help. These seraphim, they couldn't even help but be completely and utterly devoted to the Lord with their whole body. So their eyes had to be in reverence of his holiness. Their feet had to be covered in, in awareness of his perfection. Everything about them, their voices, it was all just aware of, of his perfection. And you know, the Bible tells us that we too are being made holy. That we are in this process of being made holy. It tells us, be holy for I am holy. And I really think that that's just an utter devotion to him. Everything we have, that, that my emotions and my everything, my, my protection over my kids, everything would be in complete devotion to God. All that I am. You know, I've taken so much action so many times out of lack of trust, out of fleshly desires. I just wanted to control situations. But we're in the making of being utterly devoted to him and waiting patiently on your victory, waiting patiently in the dry seasons and, and trusting that he's good. It's going to sharpen that holiness within us. God, we just thank you for your, your holiness, that you are without flaw, that you are, are a God of perfection, that your love is perfect, that your faithfulness is perfect, that your justice is perfect. So if we're waiting on justice, God, let us wait on you. And if we're waiting for breakthrough, let us truly wait on you quietly and patiently deep within our souls, knowing that you are good, God. Help us to know you, not know about you, but to know you, God. Draw us near. Oh, Father, thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Help us remember and not quickly forget. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus, you're all this heart is living for. I'm falling. I'm falling.